when you're sitting in front of the customer, that is the moment of truth. And everything you've done in the business, not just marketing, everything comes to roost when you are sitting in front of that customer. Hi, I'm Ed Marsh, host of the Industrial Growth Institute podcast. In some episodes of this podcast, we kind of poke around the edges of topics, and in others, we just sort of blow things up. And I think today may be one of those where we kind of blow things up, particularly the subject of strategic pricing in the context of industrial manufacturing. We're going to jump in there, but before we do, I'm really excited for this chat with Lisa Spatafora Thompson. Lisa is a globally known expert in pricing and portfolio growth for B2B companies. And, and there's a long bio and a lot of stuff, and I'm going to read it to make sure I don't miss anything, and then we're going to learn more about who Lisa really is. So she has nearly three decades of experience in pricing strategy and tactics, sales and sales management, product marketing and business strategy across technology, manufacturing, metal, medical products, B2B services, and other industries. And she's worked with companies ranging from startups and emerging industries through F100 companies and mature industries. Today, she's the founder and CEO of Sturbridge Growth Partners, which is a unique management consulting firm that helps companies break down internal barriers that prevent them from growing and scaling profitably. But that's just her latest stop. She was a partner at Deloitte Consulting, where she served as a leader in the firm's strategy practice. For eight years before that, she was a senior partner at Monitor Group. She served on the firm's board of directors. And prior to that, she was a vice president and managing director at Strategic Pricing Group, which actually was acquired by Monitor in 2005 when she was leading their Chicago office. So what I'd say is buckle up, prepare to have Lisa challenge a lot of what you think you know about pricing and strategy and product management. And please don't forget to like, share, and comment on, on this episode, whatever platform you're watching or listening on. And so with that, welcome, Lisa. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much. And I think the you just did a polite way with my bio of saying I'm really old, you know, it's really, <laughs> your bio's really long. <laughs> well, it means you've got a lot of perspective and a lot of expertise and lessons learned along the way, I think, to share with us. I certainly hope so. I hope it's a sign of wisdom. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that it is. So we're going to get to know you kind of more personally as Lisa in a minute. But first, I want to create some context. And, and on your LinkedIn, You've got some brief notes about your time with Strategic Pricing Group. We just heard that it was acquired by Monitor, but before that, you write that uh, it was a boutique consulting firm that created the discipline of strategic pricing, and that that's really cool. I mean, to to think about playing a role in establishing a whole new management practice, if you will. So let's start by telling the audience about how that came about and how you participated in creating this category. You know, so that was interesting. So the the person who really invented the field of strategic pricing is Tom Nagel. And Tom at the time was a professor at the University of Chicago. And he said, you know, I'm surrounded by some of the most brilliant economists in the world, and they really understand economics, particularly microeconomics, and they really understand pricing. But I want to be one of those people who really implements it with businesses. So he basically took what a famous marketing uh, professor said um, of his content is, isn't what you're doing with strategic pricing simply marketing strategy, but coming at it from the angle of profit driven based on maximizing the vet or optimizing, perhaps I should say the value you can capture in the form of your price. And that in essence is really what we're doing. It's profit driven, go to market strategy, profit driven sales strategy. And Tom, I think intelligently so, called the organization strategic pricing group in the late eighties when he founded it because you couldn't throw a stone without hitting a marketing organization. So he was differentiating himself and the capabilities of the organization by saying, this is strategic pricing. So fundamentally then, kind of to set the basis for our conversation, you would say that pricing is a marketing function. 
I would say that you will read in Phil Kotler and other textbooks that, you know, pricing is one of the four P's of marketing. Right. I would say that pricing strategy should be a driver of your overall marketing strategy because everything comes to roost in how much you're ultimately going to be able to capture in the form of price and whether you're going to sell the next unit to the customer at all. So I would say that it's more of a uh, driver, something that should be thought about, you know, before, during, and after product development. But too often pricing has been just an afterthought as the fourth P. And I would say too often pricing is handled by marketing and never really discussed with sales aside from handing them a a price list. And so all of the enablement conversations and justification and explanation and understanding that ought to inform their ability to really maintain margin and sell at value pricing often is missing. So we're definitely going to talk about that and how the board fits with marketing and how marketing fits with sales and how all this fits together. When, when you went to Strategic Pricing Group, were you already focused on pricing at the time or did you take the job and then become a student of it? The latter. Okay. Um, so I was a sales and sales management person. I had started my career in financial services and then moved into pharmaceuticals. And when I was at Babson College, it was like, you know, April of my second year of my MBA program. And I thought, okay, I came here to start my own company, but I don't really know what problem in the world I want to solve. So I better go work for somebody else. And, you know, today when, when people, it seems like the minute you start an educational program, you're already looking for a job and doing internships. Right. I'm old, as I said before, <laughs> right? So when I, um, when I was at that time, it was like April, it was a couple months before you graduated that you look for jobs. <coughs> and I found a job the old fashioned way in the uh, Boston Globe for a pricing and competitive strategy consulting firm. And at, um, at the time, um, I didn't know anything about pricing, nor did I know anything about consulting. But I learned a lot about it when I went into my interview process. And so I learned it from them. So you didn't start in pricing, you didn't start in marketing, you started in sales, but only partially. I mean, looking at your educational background before you went to Babson, you were undergrad, you did a French language and literature major and economics. Where Your name doesn't sound French. Where did the French come from? I had studied French in, um, in high school and in middle school. For some reason, middle school, the French was the only language that I had access to other than English um, in the curriculum. And so, and I just really enjoyed it. And I had... I had thought once I went to college that I was at a liberal arts program, but I thought I really need to major in economics. And then the the nun who ran the French department um, said to me, so I understand you're thinking you might not major in French literature. And I said, yeah, I feel like, and my parents feel like I need something practical when I get out. And she said, well, I'll give you something to think about if you you can major in economics if you want to, and you'll know a lot about economics and you'll learn about business, but you'll never know a damn thing about yourself. <laughs> That's what she told me. So I ended up almost double majoring in both. I was, with that sort of a, a piece of advice, I had to major in French literature, but I came close with a, a double in uh, economics. Got it. Um, and my sense from your career is that there's been a very strong international theme throughout your entire career. And I don't know if it spawned from that, but last time we spoke, I think you were just back from Spain. And I know you've already jumped into some entre entrepreneurial business communities there. So how did your international business interest develop and how has that then pervaded your career since then? Well, when I first started in the business, we were working with mid-sized and very large companies, many of whom were operating internationally. So even if you were working with the U.S. headquarters, the, you 
hopefully, you know, you did a good job and they would say, you know, we have this problem in fill in the blank, Mexico, in um, Spain, in France, um, and then more and more in, uh, in various Asian uh, countries. So that's, it started at a, at a pretty early stage and it's just expanded from there. And now I do a lot of um, advisory work on the continent of Africa as well. Certainly, if we talk about pricing, I know over the last 10 or 15 years, my sense as large multinational organizations have harmonized their purchasing and there's information mm -hmm. available on the internet, the question of pricing becomes trickier and trickier for companies that have very different markets that they have to price for, but then they've got buyers that are interested in the prices that are available in other places around the world. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, more and more, for the reasons you said, people are becoming aware of their competitive uh, competitors' prices, even in situations where they're not, like some, you know, highly complex industrial uh, products where people are maybe a piece of a, a capital equipment that somebody might be making a lot of choices to customize that particular piece of equipment, and they have a service package that goes with it and all those service packages can look different it can be really hard to tell what somebody else is or isn't paying for something mm -hmm. but what makes that even more dangerous is that salespeople are then getting all of their information about competitive prices from purchasing agents which are a lot larger and more sophisticated today than ever as you said right, right. You mentioned Africa. What's what's got your interest and, and focus there? So I was invited to attend a conference of a group called the Harambians, which is a collection of about 300 or so African entrepreneurs who are highly, highly vetted. It's very selective. The founder of the organization loves to say that the acceptance rate is lower than it is at Harvard for uh, for their undergrad programs. And, and it is. And these are all really incredible entrepreneurs who have for-profit businesses. Um, the ones that I work are, with are primarily business to business. Um, and they are <clears throat> founding, they founded businesses to solve some of the problems that most plague the continent so it might be um super high youth unemployment rates or right. access to capital for the average kenyan or nigerian um and having people get access to these incredible talent pools that exist on the continent of africa and so i coach a lot of them in terms of their pricing and growth strategies interesting uh, and is that typically done remotely or are you spending a lot of time over there? It's majority remote. I have been to South Africa and been to Kenya. And I think my next visit will probably be Nicaragua. But for the most part, it's remote. Got it. Um, we're both in the Boston area. Um, and with your interest in African business, and you mentioned Harvard, you you may be familiar with the Harvard um, Africa Business Conference that happens annually in February. You know, I know of it, but I haven't actually been to that. You yet. ought to go check it out. I think you'd find another crop of really inspiring, thoughtful entrepreneurs, um, and you, you find out a lot of about a lot of really interesting technology. Particularly, there's a lot of a lot of technology stuff happening, particularly in Nigeria, um, but a lot of a lot of the uh, online banking tools, the phone-based banking tools that we mm -hmm. use, I think originally were developed in many cases in Africa where, you know, pe people don't have bank accounts. Yeah. Their phone represents yeah. their bank account, basically. Exactly. Exactly. I'm going to check that out. I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't a lot of overlap Probably, between yeah. the organizations. Yeah. Um, so with a lot of travel over the years, what's your favorite place to visit? Valencia, Spain which is where you were just a few weeks ago, I think, right? Yeah. I, my daughter has been living there doing an internship in the real estate space. And um, my son actually also is doing a semester abroad in Spain. He's almost done. He was in Madrid just an hour or two away. But um, 
Valencia has a very special place in our hearts because we lived there for a summer when my kids were younger because my son uh, participated in a soccer academy there. So we said, oh, let's, we have the flexibility, let's go with them and work from Valencia. And it reminds me a lot of Boston, which is one of the things I love about it. It's a similar size. It's, you know, they have the great city, great culture on the water. So I would probably say that is my favorite place. If I had to live somewhere else, it. it would be there. And how about most challenging country to do business in that you've encountered? To do business at, I mean, it definitely would be one of the African nations because as much as there is so much change being brought to the continent, you do have parts of some of the governments that are still corrupt, that are oh, yeah. still working against the people. And, and you really have to help people figure out growth strategies in spite of those things. Right. So some of the companies, countries there, I would say, those would have to be the toughest. Yeah, it's really, it's a degree of friction. We've got a lot of friction with regulation. They've got a lot of friction with corruption that, you know, in many cases when you're in it, you don't even realize it. It, it, it doesn't feel like it's abnormal. But you just have to figure out how to adapt to it. Exactly. And they're getting, I worked with, uh, I've been working with one organization that is getting basically access to capital to people and they're operating like a bank and the level of regulation that they are now going through in various countries, it's good, it's good, but it's going from just one type of challenge to another, right. to your point. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, then American companies trying to do business in those markets have to be aware of the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and the implications mm -hmm. of if we just kind of wink and nod or look the other way, or even if we're completely ignorant, but one of our agents or reps undertake some corruption, for instance, to get product through customs, then we're personally criminally liable. It's a, it's a very exactly. difficult situation. Exactly. That's why so many of those organizations have to or should, if they don't, have all of their employees go through training in those right. areas. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, shifting gears a little bit, I'm going to read a line that uh, that you've written that I think is is really, it's interesting, and it's going to, I think, maybe offend some people, and that's okay, and, it, and I think it's going to drive some conversation. So here we go. Many B2B companies blame the economy, their competitors, and aggressive buyers for their inability to close deals and grow profitably. The yeah. root cause of the problem, however, often lies with the leaders themselves. Yeah. So. Now, having gotten under some people's skin, talk about that a little bit. Um, I realized when I was probably about 10 years into my career that while I had spent a lot of time commiserating with clients about you know, what they were experiencing, I got to a point where I was sort of confident enough in what I did and my area of expertise to say, you do realize that every company is dealing with aggressive competitors. Every company <laughs> has high cost to serve some customers that are much higher than other customers. If you're operating in the US, for example, and the economy is in a downturn, you realize all your US competitors are experiencing that same downturn, right? So the issue becomes how we operate to overcome those things. And leaders can, unfortunately, on occasion, spend too much time railing against the procurement departments of their customers or what their competitors are doing. Why are they so stupid? Why don't they know they should be you know, pricing this way or that way? When a lot of it is, do we really want to grow and do it profitably? And if we do, let's look at the things that we have control over. Right. I have that conversation about sales all the time. Um, there's just such a propensity to make excuses and to blame external factors. And I think the army beat into me that at the end of the day, none of that matters. It's up to us to figure out how to get it done. And that's not a pleasant pill yeah. to swallow in many cases. And there seems to right. be, I would say, a, a deterioration in accountability across business in general. Have you sensed that or, or not? Yeah, I would say yes. But let me make it a little more specific. You mentioned sales, and I would say sales is the function in 
most B2B organizations that gets blamed the most mm -hmm. for why the deals aren't closing, why they aren't closing at as high a price as we want them to, why the profit margins aren't as good, they've given things away. And maybe this is just me because I started my career in sales. So I'm, you know, you can take the girl out of um, <laughs> sales, but you can't take the sales out of the girl. But I, I think and help many leaders realize that, yes, there are tools. There is training that the sales organization needs. And of course, right. we do that when they need it. However, there are several things leading up to the point at which you're going to sit with someone to either build a relationship and or negotiate. And many of the other functions in the organization have not given the salespeople what they need to be successful in those negotiations. So they in many get cases, they probably don't even know what they should be giving the sales team. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what we help them with. Got it. All right. So obviously we're going to jump into pricing. We've been teasing at it and that's, that's one of the primary topics, but first let's talk a little bit about product management. Okay. When I look at middle market industrial manufacturing companies, particularly in the capital equipment space where I spend a fair amount of time, it feels like that's an area with a huge potential for improvement. What makes a great product manager? I think a great product manager has got to understand directly from the CEO, what are the goals of this organization and how do you see them tying to this particular product that either we're just launching or that we have in the market? What do you believe good looks like? Is it we have to drive share at all costs with this particular product because of what's you know, coming next, what's coming down the pipeline, and we believe we're going to get an installed base. That is a strategy that is overutilized too frequently. Everybody like harkens back to the like the, you know, the Microsoft, originally the Microsoft strategy with the operating system. But for most businesses, that isn't how they're going to win. But really understanding that the goal of any for profit business, and industrial manufacturing is not exempt from that. Right. Your goal, aside from whatever your overall mission is for whatever problems you exist to solve, your goal is to maximize the total contribution dollars that you bring into the company through that product for which you're the manager. And, and what do I mean by that? That it's not either about, it's not just about high margins, because there are situations where more volume at lower margins can maximize, particularly maximize more sustainably, the total contributions that your product brings in to the organization so that you have more to cover, fixed cost, and hopefully then some left over, you know, to go into pure net profit. Mm -hmm. And so I think that mindset of product managers is really important. However, in the spirit of accountability that you were just talking about, if you don't have a CEO who understands that and encourages that of the product manager, is it really the product manager's fault if they don't have that mindset? So that makes perfect sense. I am surprised. I thought when I asked what makes the great product manager, the first thing I was going to hear was that they spent a lot of time talking to customers. And you said instead they spent a lot of time talking to the CEO. I've always had the sense that the product manager was essentially the voice of the customer. Is and, and, and I don't know much about it. So that could be ignorance or naivete, or maybe it's just embedded in your assumption. Help me understand about that. Yeah. So I'm glad you asked that because if it sounded like I don't think they should be spending a lot of time with customers, absolutely not. They have got to be. But I don't think the product manager is the voice of the customer. I think okay. the product manager is the voice of the intersection of the customer and the company got and it. where that intersection overlaps to make it a win to make it profitable, to drive the most value 
for both parties. Got it. So the environment, you could be a great product manager in the wrong environment if the CEO doesn't get it. The environment that's necessary to elicit greatness from a product manager is a company that understands that basically that that situation you're just describing, where we're trying to optimize for the customer, we're trying to optimize for the company, and how do we figure out the place in the middle? Exactly. Exactly. And and for a hundred or two hundred million dollar or fifty million dollar uh, industrial manufacturer, they may not have enough money, or they may not think they have enough money for a full time product manager. Often, that responsibility gets folded informally, or maybe formally in with some others. What have you seen work best? What marketing discipline or what job role do you find product management fits closest with if somebody has to do it on a part-time basis? Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting question. And I know I'm giving you that, you know, um, lawyer, consultant, economist <laughs> answer. It depends, right? right. It, I, I really have seen particularly when you get into, <clears throat> you know, companies under say 500 million and below that you really want it to be specific to how the organization is structured, the type of products that you're manufacturing and selling and the specific people who are available to you at the time. So people tend to ask me the question more often, where should pricing sit? whether you have a person who does pricing, you know, has that in their title, their actual role, or it's just part of their, uh, part of what they do, part of their day job. And a lot of times in smaller organizations, it will sit with product management. Mm -hmm. um, in some of the organizations that are like 50 or $100 million, they're, they're, it's sitting with engineering, right? In industrial firms the engineering folks are doing the product development, the product management, they're going back to get MBAs after they've gotten, you know, their civil engineering or industrial engineering degree. And so they have product and pricing sitting underneath them. But I have seen pricing be successful and be a disaster under finance leadership, under sales leadership under marketing leadership. And I would say, you know, every organization is not going to be able to do this, but I've had some clients for whom the CEO felt it was such an important function that the pricing function was reporting directly to her or him. Mm -hmm. And um, that's rare today. That's rare. And honestly, now I'll make, first I made your audience cringe. Now I'll make <laughs> with, the, with the, the barriers point, but now I'll make my colleagues cringe. I don't really believe pricing needs to be its own function in most organizations. I just believe that you need to have the right function and the right person within that function for your organization leading it. And it has to be somebody who has those product management skills, like they know the customer, they talk regularly to the customer, they understand the products, they can understand the company and the environment in which it operates, right. the competitors, they get financials. It's a real cross-functional role. Now, obviously you consult with companies on that. Can you also, do you operate fractionally? Can you help them identify and hire the right person? Can you take somebody that they have and train them to do that? What ways do you work with companies on filling that role? Yeah, so I'll start with your last thing. You asked earlier about Strategic Pricing Group, the organization that Tom Nagel founded. Um, he started that organization not as a consulting one, but as a training one. And as a lot of consulting organizations are born, what happened was the training clients were saying, hey, we need you to work with our people, start a consulting organization. So anybody who grew up there, myself included, is very steeped in learning how to actually teach people to do this profit-driven marketing strategy, um, pricing st more strategically directly. Um, I don't operate as 
a fractional, nor does anyone in my firm. Mm -hmm. it, it would tend to be more, some people might want a retainer. I don't know, maybe you could call a retainer fractional, but they're not, it's usually not like a 25 hour a week role right. at any one organization. Um, and in a lot of places, it doesn't need to be. It depends on the number of deals you're doing, the number of products you have come out. For a lot of clients, they just, you know, they have a, say, a handful of core products and then some variations right. off of that. And it's a 30, 50, 80 million dollar client. They don't need a full time pricing person and they don't need, you know, they're not constant negotiations. They're not constantly might develop something new every two, three years. So. It, it really is more like a mix of retainer, consulting relationship, or training and workshops. Workshops have become very popular because they're a mix of teach me how to do this, but apply it right. to my business with me. And that's very, very popular today. And and in a mid-sized company, do you insist that executive management participate in the workshop even though they don't own the function? Do you want them there so they have the context or do you not care about that? Yeah, no, we care about that because we, first of all, any area of discipline, if you aren't aligned on the principles with the CEO, and I, I should say maybe the C-suite more broadly, it depends on the functions, but say... The CEO, the chief commercial officer, chief right. revenue officer, maybe the COO, maybe the CFO. If you're not aligned with the principles around strategic pricing, and at the end of the day, you're going to say, look, I just want you to go figure out <clears throat> every individual customer's willingness to pay and don't lose any deal due to <laughs> overpricing. I would say, maybe, maybe this is me, I can be like this at this stage of my career. <clears throat> don't don't hire us, that's a waste of money. Right. That's just a waste, you can do that yourself, right. you know? So, so that makes sense. Um, and obviously we've been kind of diving down into the weeds, talking about the specifics of the job, but let's, zoom back out, let's zoom back out through the C-suite right up to the board. I know you've got a lot of independent board director experience and we're always told, you know, nose in, fingers out. But if senior executives are the root cause, as you said, they may be, um, or if they're at least ignorant of the nuance of what you need to do, then it feels like there's a necessity for some of this insight to perhaps be on the board. And if you're a director on a board of a company where executive management and marketing and sales don't really get it, how do you work with them? How do you challenge them? How do you provide oversight? How do you provide the operational insight, but do it through the lens of governance? Yeah, so the, the really cool thing about profit-driven or strategic pricing is that it's a large contributor to growth and not just not just the you know bottom line growth but also the top line because when you're doing it right you drive more revenue you close more deals right if and if you have a true competitive advantage you can have market share as well as you know margin dollars so i think of it when i'm uh, when i'm in a governance role the same way I would ask the C-suite questions to pressure test the validity of a strategy and that it's really going to mm -hmm. withstand, um, you know, like Mike Tyson says, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Is right. it really going to withstand the test of the marketplace? What's going on with the trends? What's going on with competitors and pricing? is just part of that overall strategy. So I pressure test and ask questions about it the same way I do about the corporate strategy when I'm part of a board. Got it. So let's leave the cost structure out of this question, thinking just about it from the kind of from the top line perspective. What would you say are the three most common causes of lack of profitability? 
Okay. That's a really good one. Because when you can't really think about cost, one, not understanding the value okay. that you offer, like the true economic value of your offering above and beyond the next best competitor that you have. That That's probably number one. Okay. Related to that, I mean, these are all somewhat intertwined, but related to that is <clears throat> there are companies who over-engineer things. You know, like somebody's built a Ferrari and there's they want to sell it to a segment that is only interested in paying for a Toyota Camry. Like right. They literally don't have the budget for a Ferrari. It's not a negotiating tactic. You've right. over, you've really overbuilt this. And the third one I would say is lack of a discounting strategy. And that's something that people also like, what is a discounting strategy? I mean, as a, as a pricing person, aren't you going to tell us that we shouldn't be discounting? Absolutely not. Discounting is part of a negotiation in B2B markets, especially in the industrial market space. How, how can you get away with it? Even if you have a product that is really differentiated, discounting always rears its ugly head. So there's nothing bad about discounting. What's bad is that most companies don't have policies thought about beforehand so that the salespeople have in their toolbox things where they could say, oh, I thought you wanted the parts to come within two days every time they delivered, but you're, every time we deliver, but you're saying you can't pay 10 and you want to pay eight. Well, I don't just go down to nine. What I say is we have an $8 offering. The parts come in seven days, not in, in two days or right. et cetera. And so I would say that a lack of a discount strategy is also the way that we become unprofitable. Got it. Either um, because you walk away from a deal that you could have closed if you gave a good reason, like something the customer had to do or give up to get a lower price. So where, you know, we either lost the deal or we closed it at a much lower price than we needed to. I worked with a sales team one time that had a field built into, I think it was Microsoft Dynamics. When they created an opportunity, a qualified, quote unquote, qualified opportunity in Dynamics, one of the properties they completed was the expected discount they thought they were going to have to offer in order to get the deal. So before they had even begun the sales process, basically, they opened the opportunity. They're already predicting the discount. So what do you think happened? Yeah, what do, you know, I've got a similar one. I was working with a distributor of um, various types of equipment, and they had no idea that this was true until one of our consultants went into with this like hundreds and hundreds of pages of script for people who, when they would call over the phone and ask for a discount, they would have the rep ask them what they were quoted and then just immediately go 1% underneath. Wow. So you take what you say, and that's, that's bad enough, just giving a, a lower discount. But now in there, you have a built-in systematized way that you're starting price wars in your industry. <laughs> wow. And and they've done the hard work. If they had only worked on the scripts and the training to do the opposite, they could have been in so much better a position. They were so close, but then they just, it's the mindset, I guess, that goes back to exactly. the senior leadership sometimes being the problem. So exactly. you've identified those three issues. Now, if somebody's saying, I don't think that's us, but how would I know? Do you have any tips on kind of what KPIs or anecdotal sort of information they would look for that would help them say, well, you know what? Um, I guess maybe what she's describing is a problem for us. Yeah, so I would ask questions like, um, when you develop, when you launch a new product or 
you have a product that's been on the market and you're developing the goals for it for the following year, how frequently do you meet your revenue and profit goals? Are you doing that consistently? That would be one of the questions I would ask. Um, I would also ask, could your customers tell you or could you tell me about them how much it costs them not to do business with you and people said like what it what does that mean but if you don't know right how much your customer loses because they don't do business with you there's no way you understand value because it's very easy for people to say we understand value but when you ask that question and they can't answer it like well we have you know 99% on time delivery and the next best competitor has 96 and that 3% if you're in this particular application it can be really problematic because the whole line shuts right. down if you don't know what that extra 3% of 3 percentage points of delivery um, accuracy gets you, you don't really know value. Right. So be asking uh, questions like that, like how, how costly is it? Tell me your customers who are, even without numbers, the least costly, the most costly, and an average amount of cost to serve them. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean just give me the cost of the actual product, but the product, you know, five different customers could be buying the same exact product, but who buys it in huge volumes and small volumes? Who breaks into the line 25 times before you get the product out the door? Who's right. eating up all your technical and engineering resources and who's not using them at all? Right. So typically when you get down to questions like that, a, a lot of companies won't be able to answer those, but I'll tell you, you know who's the absolute best at it. The smaller the company, the better they are, generally speaking. And do you think Why? in those because cases- there's one P&L. Is it documented or is it gut feeling in those small companies? Well, it, it could be that it's just the, you know, say it's a $10 million company and it has a single, the founder, owner, Right. kind of company and he or she just has they just know i mean sometimes it's documented but sometimes it's just those guys are costly we're charging them more and there's only one p l and it all comes up to that founder owner right. and they can see all these different pieces but the bigger we get you know we need hierarchy and bureaucracy so that the level of complexity doesn't cave in on itself but i had a a client that was in a multi multi billion dollar company who said, "Lisa, the bottom line is, as we get bigger, we get dumb, right?" And what he and it was around this exact topic that we were talking about. You've got this person owns revenue, this person owns fixed costs, this person owns variable costs, someone right. else owns this, and we believe that if we have all these different roles and everybody has different goals structured to optimize their own area somehow it's all going to add up to more profit and growth and sustainability over the long term but it doesn't it doesn't work that way right. but it does work very intuitively for a lot of really small businesses makes this sense this is one PL. right all right so now as promised we're going to dig into pricing and and <laughs> I, I don't know Do you that think we haven't been talking about pricing See, well we've been doing <laughs> when you do it been... strategically, this is pricing. Yeah, good point. I mean, I it, I guess we've been dancing around it a little bit, okay. but but I want to get to um, kind of this fundamental question of I've always heard there's three models of pricing. Mm -hmm. There's cost plus. There's market pricing. You know, this is what the market charges for it, and so we're going to try to make it as inexpensively mm -hmm. as possible and charge what the market charges. And then yeah. there's some form of value pricing. You've been talking a lot about value. But I think uh, at one point you 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 uh, mentioned to me there's actually a fourth, and you may break it down different ways. So tell us about different pricing models. Yeah. So you're asking about pricing level, 
right? Okay. But all of these other things we've been talking about, and I know you know this, I was teasing you, it's all about pricing. So why I call it strategic pricing is because it is about customers. It is about costs. It is about what your competitors are doing. And it is about the broader macroeconomic environment and about technological and other trends that are taking place, whether it's AI or issues related to sustainability. In strategic pricing, all four of those things matter. You don't make a choice between one or the other. They all matter. And we ask very different questions about each of those things than many organizations ask. So for example, a lot of organizations, if they're um, doing this customer driven pricing, it's all about going out negotiating or even before we negotiate, doing surveys where we're asking customers what they're willing to pay. Now, that could work if customers, A, always know what they should be willing to pay. Sometimes they don't know, like let's say we came out with a new product and it's new to the market and it's a new market, right? They don't necessarily know. And even when they do know, if there's a procurement group involved, are they inclined to tell us how much they really right. think the thing is worth? So when it comes to the customer question, we we think about customer pricing too, but what we say is, what is the economic value beyond their next best alternative? And given factors that are likely to affect their price sensitivity, how much should I be able to convince this segment of customers to pay. Okay. And then you might say about costs, you know, a lot of the companies will say, well, how much does it cost us to make that? Okay, well, we want a 15% margin. So let's understand our costs and then tack 15% on top of it. What you really want to say about costs is for that particular segment I want to serve, given what I just said, I should be able to convince them to pay, how much cost can I afford to incur in serving them and still make a profit that's that's fair and left left over at the end? And in some places, it might be a huge segment with lots of volume and they do need lower prices because budgets are different, but it might be worth going after. And from the competitive perspective, a little twist on that one as well. Not how do I have to price to beat out the competitor or I want to be just a little above the competitor or just a little bit below. But with competitor, we say, look, given our capabilities, our costs, our constraints, the value we can deliver and what the competitors can and can't do, where do we have competitive advantages and in which segments should I be winning those things all day long and at a higher price, Right. potentially? Um, now, sometimes your part of your advantage is a lower price. So we take those and we think about the things that are going on from a macro perspective. And all of those are part of strategic pricing. That's why I no longer call it value-based pricing, because people think that value-based pricing is just about getting a premium mm -hmm. for something. But it's really strategic pricing because there are times when you shouldn't get a premium. Right. You don't deserve to get a premium. Or if you choose not to have a premium, you unlock a whole market for yourself that's very profitable. Yeah, and I guess then there's questions about do you create a, a different brand to go after some of those depending on the uh -huh. situation. Um, but there's also, of course, situations, and I always come back to the capital equipment um, world where, where I tend to live a lot. You know, companies will, on the one side of the business, make million dollar machines that uh -huh. include large integrated systems. Sometimes they're buying components. The margins are typically 15 or 20 percent, but they've got a completely different business model and pricing model in the aftermarket. So 
the mm-hmm. down payments or progress payments on the new machines they're selling provide the working capital for the business. But the aftermarket is a driver, a huge driver of profitability. Often, you know, it may be 20 or 30 percent of the total revenue, but it's 50 or 70 percent of the of the profitability two completely different business models two different pricing models is at what point do you worry about trying to integrate things or bundle things or do you just keep them as separate so when let me do this based on size of company for a minute and then we can talk otherwise smaller organizations need to be focused on doing one thing and doing it really well. Why? Because they can't compete with the breadth of resources that the larger organizations are going to have. On the other end of the spectrum, the larger organizations will often find that that thing they do really well, that when they launched it, sold like hotcakes, but now other people have knocked it off and they're only going to get like 30% of the market that needs that serious differentiation. So like the example that you gave, they need different offerings, which almost equate to different business models within the same organization. Okay. So the bigger you get, trying to integrate is not actually the right thing. Making sure there is knowledge of one area versus another, but you talked about an organization that, you know, could an organization, do you have to have a separate model for doing something? And a lot of, I worked with a company that um, did valves for commercial air, like, HVAC and Mm -hmm. uh, commercial stuff. And they went to market very effectively after, you know, we, we put the right strategy in place with a valve that was going through the same channel of distribution that was literally more commoditized. You could get the same thing from China, but it mimicked what you got from China in that it couldn't, you couldn't get it fast. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get it fast. There was no support that went with it. There were no training materials because this thing's a commodity, right? Everybody knows what it is, but that same business had the valves were often bundled with other products, came with a level of training and a certain number of hours from the product leads each week, you could get that particular valve within always within a very short time frame. So when you think about that, they haven't integrated anything there. They're really operating two different types of models. And if you want to sell to a complete market that has all different segments and different varying levels of price sensitivity and need, for your differentiation, varying levels of that, you don't integrate. You have to offer it. You have to operate separately. Mm-hmm. And how about a situation where a company, increasingly, companies are talking about partnerships? You know, it's it was well established in the software space. I think something like ninety five percent of Microsoft's B two B business is sold through resellers or value added resellers, mm-hmm. or whatever they're calling them. And and that sort of partnership mentality seems to be growing. To some extent, that exists through sales channel, but companies are also looking at partnerships with adjacent technologies. And um, in some cases, those are based on introductions and the other company comes yeah. in and sells. In some cases, they white label. In some cases, they they yeah. brand it or, or they sell acknowledging that it's a different brand, but price it together with other stuff. How do you begin to think about those kinds of situations where there's even a, a, a step removed with a different company? Yeah. So how do you think about them as it relates to pricing or? Yeah. yeah. So the one thing, let me start with this. I don't think enough industrial companies that I see think about partnerships or go the partnership route enough. I agree. They have a tendency to, you know, like 
this um, software, for example. I mean, it's no longer when you when you talk about um, industrial and the people that listen to this podcast, there is no way that most of the organizations aren't doing some form of internet of things, some form of software, some level of service that goes with their offering. I mean, gone are the days when you were just manufacturing that valve, right? right. Now you have a software, a piece of software that can help people determine if that valve needs to be replaced before it even needs to be replaced. And you've got technical services that go with it, et cetera. So that's something I think that a lot of manufacturing firms are not doing enough of is mm -hmm. partnerships. And so how the pricing works with the partnerships vary depending upon the type of partnership it is. So you get like some of these organizations that are really large and they're truly just box movers for your product. Well, they're not trying necessarily to get the highest prices. They don't li provide a certain level of service that their customers are paying them for. So the question is, is it more profitable for me to just have them, in essence, do the distribution and move the boxes around? And in that scenario, you, you have to ask, do I have the kind of brand power in the market where I can sign the deals with the customer and get the pull from those distributors and they act as a partner to me just because it's less costly? Right. to move to them. But then you get other partners who are really value added partners. They're adding services above and beyond. So they're not only saving you costs, but they're enabling you right. Right. to collectively charge higher prices, for example, to the customer because of everything that's going along with it. And you have to serve them in that higher value, higher cost to serve way because of how they're going to market. But then they can get the price points for it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to help them. I mean, I do a, have done a lot of work with clients where we have to train their sales organizations and we also have to train their dealer and their distributor organizations. Right. Yeah, that's that's a whole nother topic. Um, yeah. Partner relationship management and learning systems and expectations and the ideal partner profile and how do you find companies that really right. are aligned philosophically and want to invest in having their people trained versus just have you send them line cards or whatever, you know, whatever they think about. That's right. fascinating. Um, you've talked in such great detail about the thinking and research that has to go into pricing kind of from the perspective of the marketing or product function, mm -hmm. but sales has to execute this. Mm -hmm. And it feels like there's an important bit of middleware between the thinking and establishment of the prices and then handing a book to salespeople and sending them out to the field. How do you involve sales in enough in the thinking and context to arm them with the understanding of how to go out and then, um, you know, sell at the prices that you've established. We ensure that sales people, sales managers, and the senior vice president of sales or senior vice president of sales and marketing all have a role in every strategy that we're developing. So not like one of them, it's not just here's this token salesperson who's on right. the team, but we want like on the ground sales, the person who's doing the negotiating at the national level and the most senior person in sales, typically because sales is, you know, if they're, if they're doing their jobs, well, they're with customers a lot. They're not sitting around in corporate in meetings all day long. So we often have to have two people at the manager level, at the sales level, either from different regions to get that representation or for different product lines. But it's also because if, you know, the number one thing, if somebody can't, you know, the CEO can't join a meeting, if she needs to go meet with her board, that comes first. And the salespeople can't join a meeting if they have to go meet with a customer. So that's why we often have a couple of them 
in each of those roles, depending upon how large and complicated the strategy is at every step along the way. So they're also learning the functions that other people play and their constraints and the hurdles that they're trying to overcome. So there's right. heavy involvement from sales because it doesn't, it doesn't work otherwise. And that's why what we hand the salespeople, they have created with us and they help teach other people how to do it. So you typically want sales leaders who are strong and have the respect of the rest of the sales organization so you can co-teach it. Makes sense. So they participate in creating it and then they go back and evangelize it and teach it to their salespeople. Exactly. Okay. For the last couple of years, it seems like so much of pricing discussions has been just based on supply chain and inflation and rising labor costs and difficulty mm -hmm. accessing components and materials. Um, a lot of companies' conversations about pricing has just been about how to get increases through, when to push them through, how to get them through, how to get them to stick. Yeah. Um, and it feels like that ends up shortchanging the pricing conversation, but it still has to happen. How do you advise companies to handle that? Yeah, I mean, it's just reality. It's something they have to deal with. And we, you know, in the recent past, of course, we've seen inflation levels that unless you were alive and working in the 1970s, where, you know, I was born in 69, so I was there, but I didn't know anything about the inflation rate at that time. If you aren't like, you know, in your 70s, probably, and understand what went on, then you've never seen inflation like this in your lifetime and there are some organizations where people they're constantly just negotiating to either keep prices where they are or have them go as low amount down as they possibly can right. and all of a sudden they had to go to places and justify increases now we were talking to our clients during when we were in the pandemic and um, the president announced the first stimulus package. We did a webinar and said to, I don't know, there were probably a few hundred people. We did it a couple times. There were probably a few hundred people who joined. And we said, you have to start building inflation escalation clauses into your contracts now. And I had clients who I have worked with for years that were, you know, sending me chats in the in the uh, chat room in the webinar saying, are you kidding me? What are you talking about? It's like, how do you think we're going to pay for this giant stimulus that we put out there? We're going to experience serious inflation. Right. Most companies did not get ready for that. And even when they had to take increases, they were spending so much time like uh, wringing their hands and our salespeople have never taken increases. It's like, look, <laughs> now we're in a point where if you don't take it soon, you may have just missed the entire boat and right. the ability to take it. And finally, it was just a no brainer. And when a lot of times when salespeople went to the customer, followed by a very well worded letter that came from like the CFO, for example, of the company, explaining what was going on with costs, why they needed to do what they needed to do, they accepted it. But where a lot of people got stuck is that they they weren't ready still with changes in contracts to acknowledge that if you're going to live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. If you're trying to get increases when the cost of some particular raw material or commodity goes up, the customers are going to turn to you when it goes back down too. And that's right. why cost needs to be just one piece of this overall profile of how we do business. But at the end of the day, the answer, the very direct answer to your question is, you know, it's just reality and people were experiencing just costs of being in, in business that everybody has to say, look, all the customers in the marketplace just have to take this. Right. Because half of us will be out of business, right. you know, if you don't. Right. So we can't have a conversation these, these days without touching on AI. 
Have you seen <laughs> any interesting applications of AI in pricing strategy? So I would say not, well, let me say this because I don't do anything in business to consumer. Mm -hmm. And I do think in the B2C space, there have been some very interesting applications of AI. Um, I, from a B2B perspective, I've seen incredible applications of machine learning and building models that, you know, people throw around the term AI loosely and sure. often right. call, and I'm not an expert in it, but will often call something AI when it's really just an issue of machine learning. And so we built, um, and by we, the brilliant people on my team, not me, built this um, fantastic machine learning model for a chemicals company that basically took into consideration if this is what's going on in the economy, if supply and demand for this particular commodity look like this, if it's this region of the world, if it's this, that it the machine can actually spit out, you should go in at ten ninety nine a pound hmm. for that. So I have seen lots of interesting applications of and, and successful applications of machine learning. I think it's coming rapidly from an AI perspective, but really, truly artificial intelligence, I, I haven't seen it yet with my clients in the industrial space. And of course, so many of the questions that you've, that you've um, laid out through so many of the answers um, that, that we've gone through, I'm, I'm not saying that very well. As we've talked about a variety of different points, you've articulated questions that you need to ask your clients in order to get the information that you need to create the strategy. And they wouldn't know to ask themselves those questions, much less to put that into a chat GPT prompt, for instance. And so it's, of course, yeah. that experience that you alluded to at the beginning with your years of wisdom that gives you just intuitively the understanding of what are the relevant factors that you need to pull into it. That's that's true. And it is it is an art and part science to really be able to ask insightful right. questions that will take you down a very different path to the real truth, so right. to speak, if you will. Right. Shifting gears a little bit, I know you're active on a or have been on a couple different boards at Babson and you volunteer in some other areas that are important to you. I, I know Boston Youth Empowerment, I see it on your social media, I see it in your profile. Tell me about the the nonprofit stuff that's important to you that you work on. Yeah, so anything related to youth and fostering education has always been important to me. Um and that you know can naturally take you to higher ed. Um, so I am on the board of trustees at Regis College and then the College Advisory Board at Babson, as you said. In the last several years, I have felt and had more of a pull. Um, I really do have this, you know, I try to spend a lot of time in silence and meditating and hearing where, you know, the universe is trying to pull me and I have right. felt this large pull toward not only the continent of Africa as we've talked about but then specifically the inner city of Boston with people who are experiencing homelessness or were drug addicted alcohol addicted and trying to get into recovery and find a house find a job and not just any job because you can't flip burgers at McDonald's and afford to live in the South End in right. Boston, right? It's an expensive part of the city. I mean, Roxbury, Mattapan, Dorchester, places that were always the least expensive to live. One bedroom apartments now are like $2,300 a month. And you can't work at McDonald's. And, you know, maybe if you manage a McDonald's right. or you own a franchise, you can't work at McDonald's and Burger King and afford jobs like that. So I do a lot of focus on um, 
finding sustainable living wage jobs. Pretty much every Saturday, I'm in one of the shelters, either men or women, and helping people with resumes, wow. et cetera. And I believe we have an incredible opportunity to use business strategies and ways of thinking in the for-profit world to drive success in the nonprofit world. And because we are often loath to pay people big amounts of money to end early childhood illiteracy or end homelessness in the city, we're loath to pay the executive directors of those organizations and their staff, or we think, oh, they went out and did a campaign to raise money and they spent you know, $200,000 on a campaign to raise money. It's like, yeah, but if the return on investment is huge, if we want to get the best people, not only people who are great who can also afford to live on $30,000 a year. But if we want to solve homelessness in Boston, yeah, I'll pay that CEO at that nonprofit a million bucks a year to figure out how to do that. If she or he can bring a, you know, a great team to the forefront. So right. that's the kind of work I'm focused on right now. And especially within that, um, working with men of color who are, uh, returned from prison, trying to manage all those things, stay in recovery, and um, just change their lives around and become the the fathers and the husbands and you know the citizens that they know they can be. That's wonderful. So between running your team and working with clients and spending Saturdays in the inner city working on that stuff, what do you do Sunday? Just sleep, or do you get somewhere you burn <laughs> off some stress? <laughs> No, Sunday I'm with I'm at church and then I'm with some of the other nonprofits. Well, part of what enables this is my my kids are now adults. They're 19 and 22, right? So I'm not uh driving people to soccer practice anymore, changing uh diapers. Lots of time with family and friends. My husband and I love to entertain and we frequently on Sundays I'm always uh, having some Sunday dinner with family and friends or, nice. you know, doing some nonprofit work. And, and obviously travel is a passion. Where are you planning on traveling next just for entertainment or, or education? Yeah. So for the next big entertainment thing, we do a lot of travel with um, our kids and our, um, in particular, one niece and nephew who are married. Um, and our next big trip is going to be uh, Japan. Interesting. So I'm really excited for that. Cool. When are you headed over there? It's going to be the spring of 2025. So you got some time. So to about plan. a year from now. Like I have lots of, I won't lie and say I don't have lots of travel between planned between now and then, but I thought you'd right. like to hear my big one. <laughs> cool. Interesting. So, so you obviously participated in kind of, we'll call it writing the book on pricing, at least figuratively. Um, so where do you turn now when you want new information on these pricing topics? What, podcasts or blogs or thought leaders do you follow on LinkedIn or YouTube channels do you watch? Where do you find interesting additional incremental insight that you that you value? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So there is nothing new under the sun as it relates to the principles of strategic pricing. Okay. It's just the vast majority of the business world is still not implementing three quarters of them. Well, you described a very complex process. So, I mean, it, it's going to take time for everyone to get caught up on what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. And <clears throat> industrials, I hate saying this, but I do love it because I love working in manufacturing. Um, it, you know, that industry, we're among the worst in that industry. Right. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I taught 25, almost 30 years ago is still necessary. So, I get my biggest learning, my biggest insights actually from my clients because it's why are you not using this? What is going on? Like we've got to this. This is the thing that makes the most sense for you. Why aren't we, why aren't you doing this and learning from them and having insights 
about how to implement something differently so that it can work in their system, I would say that's probably where I get the most insights because I'll attend like the Professional Pricing Society conference. I have a lot of people who are top in their field at some aspect of pricing. And you go to those conferences and a lot of people are saying the same things. Right. You know, it's it's an issue of what's really insightful is how to do it in this particular place for this company with this set of customers. The change management and the execution of it. Because yeah. the, the theory is great, but if, but if it's all chitter chatter, no pitter patter, it doesn't matter. Exactly, I like that phrase, I'm gonna <laughs> steal that. Um, we've talked uh, several times through this conversation about intersections, the intersection mm -hmm. of the board and management, the intersection of management and product marketing or pricing, the intersection of sales and marketing and how all of these fit together. They can't be siloed the way many people have thought about it in the past. But going back to your role as an, as an independent director, yeah. what can an independent director or the board as a whole do to change the culture, to overcome counterproductive organizational silos that just are obsolete in today's business world? Yeah, so I do think there is an, that an aspect of the answer to that question that really does lie with management. You know, it's not the board's job, as you said, you know, noses in, fingers out. It's not the board's job to say, you should really be structuring your sales organization like this. Right. Now, if somebody in the C-suite comes to you as a board member and you're an expert in that particular area, you might say, well, let me talk to you about the various ways you might structure the sales organization and the pros and cons of each way. And given what I know about you, you might want this. But, you know, generally speaking, a lot of that is going to be the function of management. Mm -hmm. It is the board's job, though, to ask those really important questions like, what barriers are you experiencing with growth and with closing deals, given the people you have in the sales organization and the way it's structured? Like, I'm on the board, for example, and I'm seeing that We've now had two quarters in a row where we missed our numbers. You're telling me we've got a really differentiated product. Our costs are in line. We're not closing deals. So let me ask a series of questions about how the not even just sales, but all the commercial functions, how they operate, who's doing what, what to help you get underneath what might be happening. So I have a tendency right. to do it that way. I will say the difference with boards today, though, it definitely has to be, there is a fine line between management and governance. But today, in I don't do public company boards. Right now, I only do private company. And there is, it's not that there's less of a line between management and governance. We all still know what management in is versus good governance, but there is an expectation more than there used to be that board members will not just ask good questions, but provide really impactful advice and talk to the CEO outside of the board meeting and say, you know, let's go a little bit deeper on that topic because that is you know, I've had experience doing that like five different times. So let's talk about how you're doing it and where the problems might be. There is a, a big movement to make governance more impactful and more effective. And it's not just a box checking on the financials and, right. and you know, the or reading the audit report. That's, of course, critical, but, but that's not it. And that goes hand in hand with, I think, increased awareness of a strategic skills matrix and building the board and the role of NomGov and finding the right people, not just not just three accountants and four lawyers or two golfing buddies or whatever the case may be. Exactly. Exactly. As you look out three to five years, what worries you the most about business? In general, business yeah. in general. 
I probably worry the most that, you know, I'm going to be obsolete myself personally because I'm not, like, I look at the things that my kids at age 19 and 22, the way they they know how to, like, my daughter's 19 years old and she has her own social media and marketing consulting business. Wow. Wow. And I look at this and I go, I don't even have a TikTok account. <laughs> I have no idea how to do this stuff. And it, I do say, okay, five years from now, I think I'm really going to be obsolete, but I sleep at night and take comfort in the fact that I have offspring who will be great at that. And when I'm retired, if I need some money, they'll be able to support me. <laughs> you know? All right. So, so the flip side of that then is what do you think is the most exciting opportunity for business as they look out and how should they be positioning themselves for it? I, 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 perhaps your answer is going to be TikTok based on what you just said, but I don't know. No, I think one of the things that's really exciting for business is the way we are all saying capitalism not only works, capitalism is a good thing. But when it has run amok and it's become an equal sign for maximizing shareholder returns at all costs, I think we have people on both sides of the political aisle, if you will, saying that's not good. When you think about the original intention of capitalism and creating wealth and creating jobs and doing well by our communities and the people in them, I do see that as the most exciting and I'm most hopeful that, that we can get to that place where we get the, the best of capitalism ahead of us. That's part of the reason I believe so strongly in helping industrial manufacturers, because if you look at the good paying jobs, those those companies that form the anchors of a community that weave this fabric of society, so much of it is industrial manufacturing. And if we can help companies that are world class manufacturers become world class marketing and sales organizations, they'll they'll be unstoppable. Amen. All right, folks, I know after listening to this, they're definitely going to want to learn more. So they might be coming at you from two different angles. Generally, if, if people just want to connect with you and learn more about consulting, how do they do that? And secondly, I, I think you've got a spot for one or two more board seats on your on your portfolio right now. And so as an independent director, what kinds of companies are you the best fit for and how should they reach out to you? Oh, that's fantastic. So probably the easiest thing to say is my LinkedIn profile. Okay. And if you put in Lisa Spadafora Thompson, my whole name, I think I'm the only one. If you put in Lisa Thompson, you'd never find me. I'll but drop it in the show notes. What's that? I'll drop it in the show notes for people. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's probably the best way. I never used to be on any form of social or professional media, but now I, I have to be on LinkedIn a lot now for a number of different reasons. That would be the Do best Do you pay your way. daughter for her consulting that helps you get on LinkedIn? And she already told me, Mom, when I come home from my job in Spain. I'm going to set up a YouTube channel for you. And I said, <laughs> ah, are you going to keep it all up to date? Because I don't have to do any of that. So yeah, that's exactly what she's going to do. And as far as boards go, it's a, um, if you need somebody who's an industry expert, like knows more about a particular industry than we do, that's not me. I'm sort of industry agnostic, although all business to business, lots of manufacturing, lots of technology and medical products and B2B services. But people who need me on their boards are organizations who either have never had a governance function before and they realize they need a governance function and they need to start it from the ground up, but often taking baby steps and or companies that have had a governance function, but it hasn't been impactful. And it really needs to go to the next level because companies, when they have good governance, especially private, privately held companies, when you have good governance, 
that should help you dramatically advance your growth and profit and overall goals. Absolutely. So if you have lousy governance, you think you have lousy governance or no governance, those are usually the, the companies that call me. Got it. Okay. And so companies with that interest should reach out to you via LinkedIn as well. Absolutely. I'd love to chat with them. Good. This has been fabulous. Wrap it up for us. Two minutes on kind of encapsulated wisdom on how uh, industrial manufacturers or at least B2B companies should view and execute pricing and product management. Should view it. Say that last bit again. Should view and execute pricing and product management. Okay. Good question. I'm trying to say something different than what I've uh, <laughs> things that I've just boil said. it all down into, into a couple yeah. sentences for us. There's been so much into, into one thing. Um, this famous academic, famous marketer, Ray Corey said, pricing is the moment of truth. All of marketing comes to rest in the pricing decision. I guess I would say when you're sitting in front of the customer, that is the moment of truth. And everything you've done in the business, not just marketing, everything you've done as it relates to the products you've developed, the cost that you incur to bring them to market, the way you've priced, everything comes to roost when you are sitting in front of that customer and you can make that sale or not right. at the price you want to or not. And so pricing is about so much more than just the number and setting the level of price. And it starts as far back as the new product development process does if you really want to be doing it well and dramatically increase the likelihood that you meet your goals. So I was expecting a lot from this conversation. I, I got more than I was expecting. And uh, on the one hand, feel so incredibly ignorant about pricing um, that it's embarrassing. On the other hand, so grateful for so many wonderful insights. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me and sharing those ideas with everyone who's listening. I hope it's challenged some sacred cows for people and, and, and prompted some introspection and, and, and driven some creative thought. So thank you so much for joining, Lisa. You're so welcome, and it's been a pleasure and an honor for me to talk to you and your audience. So thank you. Thank you. So for everyone listening and watching, don't forget you got to hit the bell, you got to like this, you got to share it, and and this wisdom needs to reach people. So make sure that you offer a review, drop the link, uh, share the link with people who you know will will want to hear this, and by all means, please reach out to Lisa for more of her insights. You'll find her LinkedIn and website information in the show notes. Thanks very much.